The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome everyone. Uh, we will just be starting in uh, two, three minutes so that students join. Okay, so let's start now. <coughs> okay, so the first thing which you all should do is uh, for today we have a new file of uh, handouts uh, from which we will be doing questions. It's attached in the handout portion. Uh, which uh, has been sent to you. So kindly download this file so that I can start. Hope you have uh, downloaded the file because uh, from this file uh, we will be doing the question.
Uh, I'm sorry, due to illness, I have to, when I'm coughing, I have to pause and mute. So apologies for this. Now in uh, today's class, uh, what we are going to do is that uh, we will be doing our, and try to do our coverage of uh, two topics, right? In the previous three classes, uh, what we have done is that, uh, we have uh, studied the portion of uh, investment appraisal. We have uh, studied the portion of uh, weighted average cost of capital. Okay. And uh, then we have uh, studied the portion in the last class of uh, sources of finance. Okay. Now in today's class, what uh, my plans are that uh, we will be doing two portions. Try to do two portions. The first portion is the portion of risk management, which I will try to do in the first portion of the class. And the second portion is basically business valuations. Okay, so these are the two portions which we plan to cover in today's class and uh, as you all know that uh, when we talk about the portion of risk management and business valuation there can be no crq crq means constructive response question of section c worth 20 marks is not possible either from risk management or from business valuation okay you can only face mcqs or OTQs that means section A questions or section B questions from each of them. Okay, so in today's class, what my plans are, it uh, entirely depends on uh, whether we have uh, sufficient time or not. My plans are that uh, we will be doing two OTQs objective type questions, section B questions from risk management, and similarly, two OTQs objective type questions from business valuations. Okay so that uh, you get uh, some know-how regarding these two topics okay now talking about risk management okay we all know that uh, in the portion of risk management one is uh, expected to deal or hedge currency risk and a smaller portion one is expected to deal or hedge in prostrate risk in the portion of risk management one is expected to deal with the uh, hedging of uh, currency risk and uh, one is expected to deal with the hedging of interest rate risk okay so again, uh, not even four or five minutes have passed and uh, there are questions that uh, what about working capital management? I think this thing has been told multiple times in the webinar that you cannot expect to complete each and every area of the syllabus in just four days. Four days means only 10, 11, 12 hours. Okay, so this expectation is wrong. You are talking about working capital management. We may not be able to complete these four questions because I have to discuss them. But what is the solution? The solution was told to all of you that if any topic is left, we can provide you extra support via videos of that. So please, uh, a person should remain realistic. Okay, in 10 hours, obviously, it is not possible to cover each and every year, either or we do just a flurry, flurry, flurry and uh, don't understand anything and just uh, for the sake of completion. So have patience. If anything is left, definitely uh, you should uh, be realistic Then we will provide you extra support, okay? Okay, so in uh, interest rate risk management and uh, currency risk management, you are asked to hedge or deal with currency or interest rate risk. Now, remember, just a quick recap currency risk what was currency risk that uh, when a company wants to pay payment the rates go up risk 
or when it is uh, receiving money, the rates go down. This was called as currency risk. That, for example, a company is in Pakistan and plans to pay dollar in three months. There is always a risk that dollar rate may go up. This is called currency risk. Our company is in Pakistan and it received dollar thousand in two months. There is always a risk that this may go down. This risk is called currency risk that uh, when company has to pay, the rates go up. When company has to receive, the rates go down. Then there were three types of currency risk, or there are three types of currency risk. One is called translation risk. One is called transaction risk. And one is called economic risk. Currency risk uh, is of three types. One is called uh, translation risk, one is called uh, transaction risk, one is called economic risk. Now, what is the difference between all these uh, three types of risks? When you talk about translation risk, translation risks occur when financial statements are translated from one currency to another okay Okay, so translation risk occurs when financial statements are translated from one currency to another. Like uh, you are translating, for example, financial statements from dollar to PKR. You are translating the financial statements from GBP to dollars. So whenever financial statements are translated, the risk we face is called translation risk. Transaction risk. Transaction risk is the risk which occurs on a transaction. Buy or sell. Like a company is uh, buying something. Obviously, when you buy something, there is a risk that uh, rates go up. When you're planning to sell something, there is a risk that uh, rates go down. So, whichever risk is on buying or selling, typically buying means uh, imports and selling means export so any risk on buying selling that is imports and exports is called transaction risk okay an economic risk is risk of loss on both buy sell transaction it is also a transaction risk, but uh, it is considered a heavy form of transaction risk. Okay, it is considered a heavy form of transaction risk that uh, if company is uh, buying something and selling something, it is facing loss on both transactions. This is called economic risk. So there are three types of currency risk. Translation risk, which occurs when financial statements are translated from one currency to another. Transaction risk, risk on any buy-sell transaction and economic risk that risk of loss on both buy and sell transaction okay now if a person wants to edge or minimize 
currency risk. If a person wants to hedge or minimize currency risk, the commonly used techniques in the exam are forward exchange contracts and money market hedging. There are other techniques as well. But the most commonly used techniques in the exams are forward exchange contracts and money market hedging. These are the two most commonly used techniques. Forward exchange contract, we fix a forward rate and money market hedging, some heavy calculations which we will be shortly discussing. But in order to hedge or minimize currency risk, there are two commonly used techniques, forward exchange contracts and money market hedging. But uh, before moving to the question of uh, these two techniques, in order to solve any question of uh, currency risk management, you must have an idea about currency course. Before moving to any of these techniques, you must have an idea about currency codes. Because without having a knowledge of codes, it is uh, practically impossible to solve any currency risk question. Now, as far as quotes are concerned, there are two types of quotes. One quote is called indirect quote, and one quote is called direct quote. <laughs> as far as quotes are concerned, there are two types of currency quotes. One is called indirect quote, one is called direct quote. You must memorize three, three things with respect to each quote. You must memorize three, three things with respect to each quote in order to be able to solve the question properly. Indirect quote sign is foreign currency numerator. local currency denominator whenever you see something like this that uh, foreign currency is uh, committed denominator and the company's home currency or local currency is denominator that's indirect quote in indirect quote to convert from one currency to another we always divide and in indirect quote out of the two rates the lower rate is always the buying rate and the higher rate is always the selling rate. Okay, you must memorize these rules. Whereas in direct quote, we see that local currency comes in numerator, foreign currency comes in denominator. So whenever you are seeing in the question that the company's home currency is coming in numerator and foreign currency in denominator, that's a direct quote. Whenever you find a direct quote somewhere, you always multiply to convert. In indirect quote, we divide to convert, but in direct quote, we multiply to convert. Okay. And in direct quote, Lower rate is the selling rate, and the higher rate is the buying rate. Okay, so uh, these uh, quote rules are not uh, made by class tutors or the Kaplan decks. This is what happens in real currency markets that whenever you see currency signs like this, like uh, foreign currency comes in numerator and local currency in denominator, it's an indirect quote. You divide to convert lower buying, higher selling, and direct quote is local numerator, foreign denominator, you multiply to convert, lower rate is selling, higher rate is selling. I want you to please copy these quotes so that we can move towards the questions.
Ahmad, you have problem in currency swap, but uh, the very good news for you is that currency swap only comes in theory MCQs. There is no calculation in the syllabus, so you don't need to worry regarding that. Okay. So the thing is that I just gave you a go through that uh, if uh, you are talking about currency risk, so you must know what uh, currency risk is. So currency risk uh, basically means when a person or a company wants to pay something, the rates uh, are expected to go up. Like uh, many people are facing this that uh, they plan to pay ACCF fees in uh, pounds. So when they have to pay the fees uh, next uh, month or next uh, week, they are always afraid that the pound rates go up. This is currency risk that when you are paying the rates go up, when you are expecting to receive the rates go down, this is currency risk. Now, how to deal, manage or minimize currency risk? Before that, I told you that there are three types of currency risk. Translation risk, which occurs when financial statements are translated or converted from one currency to another. Transactional risk on imports, exports, buying, selling. And economic risk when you get loss on both the transactions. The method of dealing with these risks, most commonly used methods are forward exchange contract and money market hedging. Okay. And uh, forward exchange contract is basically where we uh, fix this uh, rate for the future. We will uh, just be doing that. Okay. And uh, another way of dealing it is uh, money market hedging. Okay. Before starting the questions, you must have knowledge, uh, detailed knowledge about uh, quotes. So there are two types of quotes, operational quotes. One is called indirect quote, one is called direct quote. You must memorize the rules of all of them. Indirect quote is where foreign currency comes in numerator, local and denominator. You divide to convert, lower rate is buying, higher rate is selling. And direct quote is where local currency comes in numerator, foreign currency denominator. You multiply to convert and the lower rate is selling, higher rate is buying. Now, taking this knowledge of currencies, let's uh, start our uh, question practice. So the first question, we will be doing the questions from the handouts file, which has been shared with all of you. Uh, there are many questions in uh, this handout file, but uh, I'm just telling you that uh, which questions we are starting with.
the first question in the handout is a dustbin company. We will do it later. <laughs> we'll start from second question. <laughs> this question is a Marigold company. This is from risk management. We will be firstly doing this question. Okay. <laughs> okay. The question states, Marigold Company is based in a country which uses dollar as its home currency. Okay, so Marigold is based in a country which uses dollar as its home currency. You must know which is the home currency, which is not, because that helps you to decide in determining the quotes. Because if foreign currency is in numerator, local is in denominator, you say indirect quote. If local comes in numerator, foreign in denominator, you say it's a direct quote. So Marigold is uh, based in a country which uses dollar as its home currency. Marigold has a wholly owned subsidiary based in a country which uses M shillings, MS as its currency. So Marigold has a subsidiary. It's based in a country which uses uh, shillings as its currency. The subsidiary's financial statements are prepared in shillings. Subsidiary is obviously in another country. Its financial statements are prepared in shillings. Due to economic uncertainty in both countries, an exchange loss of 100,000 is expected to occur after consolidating the results of subsidiary into Marigold's group accounts. So due to economic uncertainty, an exchange loss of 100,000 will occur after consolidating results of subsidiary into Marigold's group accounts. Obviously, when you have a subsidiary, you make group accounts. So an exchange loss of 100,000 will occur if you consolidate the results of subsidiary into group accounts. Marigold is expecting a receipt of shilling 300,000 from subsidiary in three months. So a receipt is expected in three months of uh, shilling 300,000, which it wishes to protect against exchange rate movement. Following information is available. Exchange rates are shilling per dollar. Now pay attention to this. This is very important. Dollar was the home currency, local currency, home currency, dollar. And dollar is coming in denominator. It's MS per dollar. So dollar was the home currency, local currency in denominator. From here, we get to know it's an indirect quote. When there will be indirect quote, we will divide to convert. And the two rates are given, spot rate, today's rate, and three-month forward rate. Spot rate, today's rate, and three-month forward rate. Two rates are given. Since it's an indirect quote, the lower rates will be the buying rates and the higher rates will be the set rates. Okay. You will be provided the currency information as well, else you cannot solve the question. So the only thing you have to capture is direct quote or indirect quote. Once you capture the quote, if it's an indirect quote, you divide. If it's a direct quote, you multiply. Okay, so the important thing is to capture quotes. Since my home currency was dollar, and dollar is coming in denominator. So when local currency is a denominator, it's an indirect quote. You divide to convert. And uh, your lower rate is basically the buying rate and higher rate is basically the selling rate then you are given the deposit and borrowing rate so deposit and borrowing rate of shilling is given deposit and borrowing rate of shilling is given 3.6 percent 4 percent this is the annual rates of deposit and borrowing in shillings and deposit and borrowing rate of dollar is given 
this is the information and this is going to be the total information of a currency risk management question this is the total information and this is going to be the total information of currency risk question that uh, company is in a country which uses dollar dollar is the home currency and uh, marigold has a wholly owned subsidiary based in a country which uses shillings okay so it uses shillings subsidiaries financial statements are prepared in shillings due to economic uncertainty exchange loss of hundred thousand is expected to occur so you're expecting a loss of hundred thousand okay after consolidation and marigold is expecting a receipt of three hundred thousand shillings from subsidiary in three months and it wishes to protect against exchange movements exchange rates are given since dollar was coming in the denominator which was the home currency it's indirect code you divide lower rate buying high rate selling and then uh, you are given the borrowing and deposit rates in both currencies okay uh jawad and uh, amir uh, i think the question is provided in the handout as well so no worries the screen was paused uh, you have the question there as well so anyways uh the question is now on the screen as well just quickly go through the question again <laughs> The question states Marigold is based in a country which uses dollar as its home currency. So you see this dollar as its home currency. This will always be given. And dollar is the home currency. Okay. So Marigold is based in a country which uses dollar as its home currency. Marigold has a wholly owned subsidiary based in a country which uses shilling as its currency. So it has a subsidiary that uses shillings. So Marigold is a country which uses dollar as its home currency and uh, it has a subsidiary which uses shillings. The subsidiary's financial statements are prepared in shillings. Due to economic uncertainty in both countries, an exchange loss of 100,000 is expected to occur after consolidating the results of subsidiary into Marigold's group accounts. So whenever there is a subsidiary, there is always consolidation into group accounts. So when you consolidate into group accounts, an exchange loss of 100,000 will occur. Marigold is expecting a receipt of 300,000 shillings from subsidiary in three months. So important thing is three months. And you're expecting a receipt of 300,000, which it wishes to protect. Now exchange rates are given shillings per dollar. So you see it's given shillings per dollar. Exchange rates are given. So exchange rates are shillings per dollar. So if you are given an exchange rate of shillings per dollar, you have already been told you have already been told that uh, shillings per dollar so dollar comes in denominator when your home currency local currency dollar is coming in denominator here you will know it's an indirect quote you will divide to convert and the two rates are given spot today's rate and three month forward rate the lower rates will be the buying rates and the higher rates will be the selling rates and then the borrowing and deposit rates are given <laughs> borrowing rates are given in shillings and deposit rates are also given in shillings and uh, the dollar rates of borrowing and shillings are also given but important thing this is annual rates always remember this is the only information which a currency risk question can provide you that's it so the summary was it uses dollar home currency it has a subsidiary which uses shillings when consolidation was done there was an exchange loss of hundred thousand dollars and receipt of three hundred thousand shillings is coming exchange rate will always be provided the currency will always be provided Okay, that uh, since uh, shillings per dollar, dollar in denominator, it's an indirect quote, divide, lower buying, higher selling, and borrowing deposit rates are given. Let's start the requirements now. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. What type of exchange rate risk would Marigold experience with 100,000 loss in the consolidated financial statements? What type of exchange rate risk would Marigold experience with 100,000 loss in its consolidated financial statements? Remember, there was 100,000 loss in the consolidated statements. So what type of exchange rate risk would Marigold experience? Economic risk, translation risk, transaction risk, and political risk. So what type of exchange rate risk would Marigold uh, face? Exchange rate risk is uh, never D. So exchange rate risk is either economic, either translation, either transaction. Okay. Uh, I never taught you that uh, exchange rate risk is political risk as well. Exchange rate risk out of three types, translation, transaction, economic. So what type of exchange rate risk were experienced with 100,000 loss in the financial statements? Now, please pay attention. If this 100,000 loss is coming just due to translation of financial statements, this will be translation. Okay. If it's coming due to buying or selling, import or export it's transaction and if it's coming on both it's economic okay so this hundred thousand risk was not coming because you bought something because you sold something remember you were in usa dollars and your subsidiary was financial statements preparing in shillings so when subsidiaries financial statements were consolidated translated into group accounts then this risk came so this risk is supposed to be a translation risk okay but Company is expecting a receipt of 300,000 shillings. Company is expecting a receipt of 300,000 shillings in uh, three months. If question it asks you that company is expecting a receipt of 300,000 shillings in three months. What is this risk? Is this 300,000 receipt coming because of financial statements conversion? No, it's not translation. When does receipt comes? Receipt comes when you sell something. Receipt inflow comes when you sell something. So this is on selling. It's a transaction risk. Okay. And for example, it was a payment of 300,000. When does payment come? When you buy something. It's on buying. It's transaction risk. However, if it says we are facing risk on receipt as well as payment, then it's economic risk. Okay. But this 100,000 was lost just because of financial statements conversion. It is supposed to be a transaction risk. Uh, there is a question from uh, Sana that 100,000 is not translation risk. I have uh, corrected the option B that 100,000 is the translation risk. So why you are asking that 100,000 is not translation risk? Yes, Assam, you are right. So, Sana, I don't know whether you are attentive in the class or not. The question is asking about 100,000 and that's why I take translation risk. Just to explain further that had the question asked about 300,000, I would have put transaction risk. So, please pay, stay attentive in the class. The question is asking about 100,000. That's why we take on option B. Okay. Question 2. If Marigold uses the forward market to hedge the receipt, what amount it will be received? 
now it is asking what amount will be received if company uses forward market forward market means forward exchange contract if it uses the forward market to hedge what amount it will be received forward market means forward exchange contract okay so <laughs> One year, that's I think what I told in the lecture that uh, if it's on both things, then it's economic. So if Marigold uses the forward market to hedge the MSPT, what amount would receive? So it is asking if Marigold uses the forward market. Forward market means forward exchange contract. What amount would receive? So if it uses forward market to hedge the receipt, how much receipt is coming? It's shilling. Three hundred thousand. How much receipt is coming? It's shilling 300,000 for forward exchange contract. You always use forward rates, right? For forward exchange contract, you always use forward rates. Spot rate are today's rate, but for forward market, you use forward rates. Okay. So there are two forward rates. It's shilling 300,000. How much will be involved to forward exchange contract? Will you multiply or divide? It's an indirect quote, so you will divide. And since it's a receipt case, when receipt comes, we always do the contract to sell. We will use selling rate. However, if it's payment case that we are paying for payment, we always do the contract to buy because in payment, we have to buy a currency and in receipt, we have to sell currency. When you have to pay someone, like you have to pay ACCA, you have to buy pounds. But if someone is giving you pounds, obviously you will go and sell. So I always remember the rule in payments, we use buying rate and in receipts, we use selling rate. So this is a receipt. Multiply or divide? Divide. Since it's receipt, we will use the selling rate. The selling rate is 1.1125. Only use the forward rates. Okay? No need to perform these workings on spreadsheet, obviously, because uh, it's MCQs, MTQs only. 300,000 divided by 1.1125. It's 269663. So we have done two MCQs. The first MCQ is uh, what uh, exchange rate risk would it face on 100,000 loss of financial statements? That's obviously a translation risk. And second, it's uh, forward exchange contract. So we use the forward exchange contract as it The third requirement is match the appropriate value to the relevant target in order to reflect what amount Marigold would borrow and deposit if it uses the money market to hedge. So match the appropriate value to the relevant target in order to reflect what amount variable with borrow and deposit if it uses money market. So we have to match the value to the relevant target in order to reflect what amount variable with borrow and deposit if it uses money market. Again. In short, the question is asking money market. In short, the question is asking money market hedging. Okay, now when you talk about money market hedging, always remember money market hedging has some systematic steps. Always remember money market hedging has some systematic steps. It's a receipt case, right? It's a receipt case. Money market hedging will have some systematic steps. So it's a receipt case, right? We are receiving shillings 300,000. We are receiving shillings 300,000. 
okay so money market has done some systematic steps it's a receipt case or a payment case it's a receipt case shillings 300000 is being received in 3 weeks shilling 300000 will be received in 3 months okay money marketing says that when you are receiving something first go to foreign bank and borrow <coughs> money market hedging under receipt states that whenever you are receiving something first go to foreign bank and borrow whatever you are receiving don't borrow that you are receiving 300,000 shillings, right? Don't borrow that. Borrow some less amount. <coughs> How much less amount? X. So that when interest is charged of three months, it becomes exactly equal to shillings 300,000. Money market hedging under receipt says that when you are receiving shillings 300,000, don't borrow from foreign bank 300,000 receipts because uh, borrowing 300,000 will create interest and your liability will increase. So borrow less amount X so that when this borrowing creates interest for three months, the amount becomes 300,000. So if you are borrowing X so that when it gets interest of three months charge, it becomes 300,000 shillings. What is the borrowing rate on shillings? You're borrowing shillings, right? You're borrowing shillings. So when you are borrowing shillings, you will use the borrowing rate of shillings. It's 4% for annual. It's 4% for annual. So if it's 4% for annual for three months, it's going to be 1%. If 4% is for whole year, for three months, it's going to be 1%. So X into 101% becomes shillings 300,000. X the amount we should borrow. Divide 300,000 by 101%. Two nine seven zero two nine. Borrow this. Okay. Then, when you borrow this amount, the next step of money market hedging in uh, receipt says, go to money exchange and sell this currency. Go to money exchange and sell this currency. Now, if you will go to money exchange and sell this currency, how much shillings? 297029. He will give you dollars. Okay. If uh, you will go to money changer and sell this currency, he will give you dollars. How much dollars? Convert them into dollars. Multiply, divide, divide. You are selling, right? You are selling. So divided by the selling rate. What is the spot selling rate? 1.125 okay forward rates are only used in forward exchange contract remember in money market hedging all transactions are taking place now so we use the spot rate 1.125 so this gives you how much dollars two six four zero two six dollars Okay. And the third step says when you get dollars, go to local bank and deposit these dollars. Go to local bank and deposit these dollars. Now, what will happen? you borrowed 300,000 was a receipt coming in three months you borrowed less amount x so that this borrowing created interest of three months equal to 300,000 you borrowed less now 297029 was bought after charging interest of three months it will become 300,000 then go to money changer and sell this currency so obviously when you in home currency is the us dollars when you will go and sell this currency you will get dollars selling so selling rate 1.125 you got dollars go to local bank and deposit dollars now 
after three months when this 297029 shillings liability will become 300,000. Obviously, after three months, the foreign bank loan 297029 shillings would become 300,000 shillings after charging interest. Your receipt of 300,000 will come from abroad. Your receipt from 300,000 will come from abroad. Clear loan, clear foreign bank loan. Now, what did you deposit in local bank? 264026. Take that out with interest. How much interest you are getting you to depositing in local bank? In depositing dollars in local bank, you are getting 6%. In depositing dollars in local bank, you are getting 6% per annum. So for three months, it's going to be 1.5%. Obviously, you have deposited dollars. So now you won't use the borrowing rate. You are borrowing shillings, so use the borrowing rate of shillings. Now you are depositing dollars, use the deposit rate of dollars, 1.5%. Three nine six zero, you will get interest. So the final amount which you are going to get is two six seven nine eight six. This is how much dollars you will get from money market agent. Now, what was the requirement? Requirement was match the appropriate value to the relevant targets in order to reflect what amount Marigold will borrow and deposit. So how much amount Marigold is borrowing? You see Marigold is borrowing in shillings 297029 or 297030. This is uh, borrowing in shillings. How much Marigold will borrow and deposit? It's not asking the final answer of money market edge. It's just asking how much it will borrow and deposit. So you know it borrowed 297029 and how much it deposited? 264026. So this is going to be your answer. Okay, we have done three MCQs from this. Any questions you can ask or you can copy the stuff and then I will discuss the remaining uh, two requirements. So, Vanya, why are you multiplying with 105%? Where is 105% coming from? Yes, Samza, hedging may result in loss as well.
I mean, it didn't ask the final answer. It asked how much you will deposit. So you are just depositing this. So one year when it's 1.5 percent, you should multiply it 101.5 percent. Why are you multiplying it 105 percent? You are not applying the calculator correctly. One percent means 101 percent. Why are you doing 105 percent? Then examiner will ask uh, the final answer. What is the final answer from money market edge? Jawad, 1.5% is given in the question. 6% is the annual deposit rate. So for three months, it's Uh, Amir, I have uh, answered this uh, yesterday as well that uh, we cannot uh, predict anything, what areas the question will come from, how much theory percentage, how much calculation, this cannot be predicted. It's better you go through the past papers, you will get an idea regarding this. I'm sorry, we cannot comment on this. Yes, then uh, this is uh, the past paper question. I don't think uh, there is uh, a question here, Maham, that uh, whether we should round up or not. We have the option. It's very clear that our answer is 297029 and it's 297030, so we should opt it. So no need to worry regarding that. Okay, one student is asking to repeat the first and the last step. So first step is uh, whatever receipt is coming, money market in states, whatever receipt is coming, borrow from foreign bank a lesser amount, X. How much lesser? so that when interest is charged it becomes equal to exact amount so you are borrowing you are receiving 100 uh, 300 000 shillings borrow less amount x so that when interest is charged it becomes equal to 300 000. so if you see shillings borrowing interest is four percent so for three months it's one percent x into 101 percent it's 300 000. so you should borrow uh 297029 okay <laughs> 
secondly go to money changer and sell so when you will sell you will use spot rate forward rates are only in forward exchange contracts okay you will sell so selling is selling rate 1.1 to 5 you get dollars and then deposit those dollars okay so when you deposit you get uh, the interest on deposit rate okay so maham 101.75 percent means you are using 1.75 percent 1.75 percent is nowhere in the question where is 1.75 percent coming from Okay, now these two theoretical questions are left and uh, as far as the long questions are concerned, long questions theoretical requirements are a bit easier because if even the student doesn't know the complete setup, what he can just do is that he can uh, explain in his own words some points and get marks. But in theoretical MCQs, if you have studied it properly, the theory has been read via text, that's what we advise, advise our regular students, then you will be able to address this because this usually comes from the Kaplan study text. Therefore, I advise everyone here, please go through the risk management chapters in the Kaplan text if you want to get through these requirements carefully. Marigold is now considering the use of an option to hedge the currency risk. Obviously, there is a product called option in which you get a right, not an obligation. Either you take it or leave it. If you do a forward exchange contract, you have to fulfill it. But uh, if you are uh, basically doing an option an option you can simply take a right not an obligation you can leave it so marigold is now considering the use of an option uh, bank has offered an option with an exercise uh, price of uh, shillings 1.125 per dollar which two of the following statements concerning the options are true the option will be more expensive to set up an imperfect hedge will result as the option will be for standard amount. If the dollar was to strengthen again the shillings, Marigold is likely to be worse off by using the option. Using an option hedge will mean Marigold is obligated to exercise the option. Okay. Some points are very easy. Which two of the following statements are true? Okay. Using an option hedge will mean Marigold is obligated to exercise option. Option is just a right. It's never an obligation. That's why it's called an option. So using an option hedge will mean that Marigold is obligated. Wrong. Option is uh, never an obligation. Okay. Then an imperfect hedge will result option does not create an imperfect hedge it creates a perfect or a normal hedge does not create an imperfect hedge that's uh, what clearly mentioned in the kaplan text so this is also wrong the correct answers are a and c why i'm explaining the option will be more expensive to set up this is written in the kaplan text that options are more expensive than forward contracts or money marketing why because options require payment of some premium because of which options are expensive so if you have just learned the features of options you can answer this that uh, i used a reverse working that i removed d and b to reach to the correct statements but you can just uh, uh, kick off with the correct statements that it's clearly written in the kaplan that option is more expensive than others because it involves a premium so a is correct okay and if the dollar was to strengthen Mary goal is likely to be worse off by using the option compared to forward market or money Now let's suppose you are using, uh, you are receiving shillings 300,000 in three months and you do an options contract. When you're receiving 300,000 shillings and you enter into an options contract, that okay, this is the rate 1.125 and I will receive Three hundred thousand shillings 
it's an indirect code divide and the options rate is 1.125 per shilling so 1.125 you do a contract at this rate you will receive two double six 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 dollars if dollar is further strengthened <laughs> dollar becomes more strong then obviously marigold is likely to be worse off likely to be worse off means it will face loss obviously if dollar improves dollar strengthens because of this contract we have locked that we will receive this amount if dollar strengthens we will be in further loss that's what is saying that if dollar was to strengthen marigold is likely to face loss or worse off so this statement also seems correct the correct answer of this would be a and c either use the correct statements or remove the wrong statements Uh, let me do MCQ number five and uh, then we will take the questions. Marigold is unsure whether to use a forward contract or a money market. Edge. It's unsure whether to use a forward exchange contract or money market and it's comparing the advantages and disadvantages of two. Which of the following advantages and statements is true? Now, there are four options. In the previous requirement, it clearly mentioned which two. So in the previous one, you have to tick two. But here, it's saying which of the following statements is true no two answers just one this is also straight coming from the kaplan uh, text you have uh, maybe you have read the advantages and disadvantages of forward exchange money market it's coming straight from that marigold is unsure whether to use forward market or money market which of the following statements do? the forward contract has the advantage of being tailored precisely to marigold requirement but the money market has will be standardized instrument the forward contract will result in marigold receiving dollar equivalent of receipts in three months whereas money market edge will provide marigold with dollar receipts today the forward contract will result in effective rate of exchange being fixed whereas money market edge will allow marigold to benefit from favorable movement marigold will be obligated to fulfill the forward contract in three months whereas money market edge could be traded on exchange to another party before set if you read all four the most clear-cut answer that's clearly mentioned in kaplan it's answer B. Read it carefully. The forward contract will result in Marigold receiving the dollar equivalent of receipts in three months, whereas money market hedge will provide Marigold with dollar receipts today. That's what the basic difference between forward exchange contract and money market hedge is. In forward exchange contract, you fix a forward rate, three month forward rate. That means you have committed that we will do at this rate dealing in three months. Whereas in money market hedging, remember, I just solved the question as well. In money market hedging, we use the spot rates, right? In money market hedging, we use spot rates. Spot means today's rates. So in money market hedging, whatever is happening, it's happening today. So that's what the basic difference between forward exchange and money market hedges. That in forward exchange contract, whatever is happening is in three months. And in money market, I think using spot rates today, B is the answer. Okay, so four and five are in front of your screen. Now I can take questions with respect to four as well as five. So Fazan part B says that imperfect hedge will result. So option does not create an imperfect hedge. It creates a perfect hedge. That's what written in the Kaplan text. And as far as D is concerned, uh, 
फैजान यूजिंग एन ऑप्शन हैज विल मीन मैली गोल्ड इज ऑप्लीगेटेड ऑप्शन देर इज नो ऑब्लीगेशन इट्स जस्ट अ राइट सो देर इज नो ऑब्लीगेशन दैट्स वाई बी एंड इज रॉन्ग पार्ट सी मिस्टर एम जरशान you see if you read the question number 4 statement that options have a price of 1.125 i am receiving 300000 shillings if i use the option i will get 266066 through this trade but if dollar further gets strengthened then obviously i will get a loss because i have fixed the rate 266666 if dollar strengthened i would have received more money Option A, Sana, is just the advantage of option, uh, disadvantage of option that it's more expensive than others. Okay, Mr. Satchel, wife. Uh, we have uh, shared everything on the WhatsApp group. You can refer to that group. Ma'am, apart from option, everything is an obligation. Apart from option, only option provides a right. Yes, options are expensive. Okay. Now, obviously. Uh, this question took uh, a lot of time because uh, after every requirement there were some series of questions from the students now i want you all that we will do one more mtq of risk management but uh, you need to attempt it on your own quickly i will solve its uh, theoretical parts okay but uh, what i want from you is uh, that okay virginia uh, all handouts are shared in the handout tab you can download from this go to webinar tab and uh, and this thing i have told multiple times at the start of the class as well that handouts are attached in this you can download them 
and you can also join our WhatsApp group because everything will be shared there. I'm just uh, sharing my WhatsApp number as well. You can drop me a text on WhatsApp after the class. I can admit you in the group. Okay. Now, in this uh, second question, that is Noon Company. Okay, that's uh, in your handouts as well. Okay. So, what my target is that uh, you read this question and do part A and uh, part C on your own. Because that has just been discussed, part A and part C. And remaining parts, I will solve it for you. Let's start. It states that Noon Company, a company based in Centerland. Please pay attention. Noon Company is a company based in Centerland whose home currency is Centerland Colon CC. So you got to know that home currency is Centerland Colon CC has been regularly buying components from and selling finished products to businesses in Flyland where the currency is the Flyland front. So Noon Company is based in Centerland. Home currency is this CC. It has been buying components and selling products to businesses in Flyland currencies FF. One particular payment of 3 million FF has to be made by Noon Company to a supplier in Flyland in three months. Now, this is a payment. Previous question was of receipts. This is a payment of 300,000 in three months. Following information is available. Two spot rates are given and three month forward rates are given. Now, pay attention. Spot rate is 6.170-6.210. FF to the CC. Yani K FF over CC. Spot trade is 6.170-6.210 FF to CC. Flyland francs to CC. Three month forward rate is 6.321-6.362 Flyland franc to the CC. That means FF to CC. Now, home currency is CC. Home currency is CC. It's coming in denominator. Again, it's an indirect quote. Again, that means you will divide to convert and the two rates, the lower rate written is the buying rate and higher rate written is the selling rate. If someone says it's US dollars to GBP, that means it's US over GBP. So it's Flyland Frank to CC, that means FF over CC. Borrowing rate, deposit rates of Flyland Frank is given, Central and Colon is given, it's uh, per annum, right? What is the cost in CC of a forward market hedge? Now, What is the cost in CC of a forward market edge? Now, how much payment we are being being, making? One payment of 3 million in three months. So it's 3 million payment, 3 million FF in three months. What is the cost uh, of a forward market edge? Forward market edge means forward exchange contracts. It's 3 million payment, multiply, divide, divide. You are paying for payment, you need to have a buying contract. For payment, you need to have a buying contract. So for payment, you need to have a buying contract. You need to buy. In forward exchange contract, we need forward rate. What is the forward buying rate? 6.321. Lower rate is buying rate. Four seven four six zero eight CC. Okay, now we will first do part C. What is the cost in CC of a money market edge? Now, this case is relating to 3 million payment in 3 months. 
this case is relating to 3 million payment in three months okay it's asking for money market rate. now in money market rate, when it's payment it states deposit money in foreign bank okay if it was receipt remember borrow from foreign bank it's payment deposit in foreign bank how much you have to pay three million uh, ff don't deposit full amount don't deposit full amount deposit some less amount x so that when the deposit earns interest it becomes equals to okay in receipt case it states borrow from foreign bank but in payment money market in states deposit in foreign bank calculation is same but it's just borrowing deposit is different if you are paying three million in three months deposit in foreign bank whatever you are paying three million not the full amount less amount x so that when deposit earns interest for three months you get three million so depositing ff how much interest it's giving 13.5 percent per annum so for three months it's going to be 3.375 percent so 103 point Three seven five percent. Thirteen point five percent is per annum. So for three months, it's three point three seven five percent. X should be deposited, earning interest of hundred and three point three seven five gives three million FF. So the amount deposited should be two nine zero two zero double five. always borrow or deposit less because when interest is charged it becomes equal to the exact amount in three months okay so 290 uh, ff should be deposited so that when interest is earned for three months it becomes three million now when you deposit amount you need to have that amount so the next step states go to money changer and buy this amount Go to money changer and buy this amount remember in receipts go to money changer and sell the amount here go to money changer and buy this amount you need to buy two nine zero two zero double five ff multiply divide divide you are buying so use the buying rate but spot rate because in money market i think spot rate is used six point one seven zero so how much dollars will be needed Two nine zero two zero double five four seven zero three four nine CC will be needed. And the third step says, where do we get this four seven zero three four nine CC? Because money changer, you are buying FF. You need to give him CC. How to get this CC form? Borrow this amount from local bank. So it's just the case that in receipts it was borrow from foreign bank, sell to money changer, and deposit in local bank. Now it's deposit in foreign bank, go to money changer and buy this amount and borrow from local bank. When you borrow 470, 349 cc from local bank you have to pay interest on borrowing so how much interest you have to pay on borrowing cc now you are borrowing cc take the borrowing rate 8.1 percent per annum you are borrowing for three months right so 2.025 percent for three months you have to pay interest of uh, 2.025 percent the interest in cc would be nine five two four and the final answer will become four seven nine eight seven three
so you have done one question of uh, receipts and uh, one question of payments copy if you have any questions please ask Okay, so it's just that uh, if we, uh, you're facing a question of receipts, it's uh, borrow from foreign bank, sell and deposit. Whereas in payments, it's deposit, buy and borrow. In the previous question, you can see that we first uh, borrowed from the foreign bank, sold it to the money changer and then uh, deposited in the local bank. But here you first need to deposit from in foreign bank, Go to money changer and buy and then borrow from local bank. okay you can copy if you have any questions you can ask remaining three mcqs we will do after the break let's have a break now okay
Okay, so we are resuming now. Requirement B, D, and E, the three requirements are left. So requirement B, which of the following relationships attempt to explain the difference between forward and spot rates of exchange between two currencies and relative rates of interest in the countries? So which of the following relationship explains the difference between forward and spot rates and relative interest rates? Two theories you might have studied. One is called purchasing power. <laughs> parity theory and one is called <laughs> interest rate parity theory. okay two theories are in a f9 syllabus One is called purchasing power parity theory, one is called interest rate parity theory. Now, what is the difference? Both almost have same formulas. Okay. But uh, purchasing power parity theory explains relationship between forward rates and inflation rates. And interest rate parity theory explains relationship between forward rates and interest rates. Okay, purchasing power parity theory explains relationship between forward rates and this inflation rates. And interest rate parity theory explains relationship between forward rates and interest rates. So these are the th two theories which explain the relationship between forward rates and inflation rates, purchasing power parity and forward rates and interest rates, interest rate power. Okay. That's why the formula of purchasing power parity is forward rate S1 is equals to spot rate into one plus inflation rate of country over inflation rate of other country. Okay. Purchasing power parity formula is S1 forward rate is equals to S dot spot rate into one plus inflation rate of one country over one plus interest rate of other country. And the formula of interest rate parity is also the same. S1 forward rate is equals to S naught spot rate into one plus interest rate of one country over interest rate of other country. Okay. Let me show you this as well. In the examination where you are given the formula sheet <coughs> you see the formula of uh, purchasing power parity and interest rate parity is given use any variables s1 f1 f0 whatever s1 and f0 they are forward rates if you can see s1 and s0 they are forward rates this and this they are forward rates these are spot rates purchasing power parity states into one plus hc over one plus hb hc and hp are inflation rate of one country and inflation rate of second country 
whereas in interest rate parity f not forward rate is spot rate into one plus ic over ib ic and ib are interest rate of country one and interest rate country two so the formula of purchasing power parity and interest rate parity is almost the same purchasing power parity theory tells you the relationship between uh, forward rates and inflation rates see in the formula it is using inflation rates whereas in interest rate parity it's using interest rates now now as far as your question is concerned requirement b requirement b is which of the following requirement b is which of the following relationship attempts to explain the difference between forward and spot rates of exchange between two currencies and the relative rates of interest in countries so what is the relationship which explains the difference between forward and spot rates of exchange and relative interest rates so the relationship that explains the difference between forward rates and interest rates that's interest rate parity that's not purchasing power parity that explains the relationship between forward rates and inflation rates but uh, the thing that explains the relationship between forward rates and interest rates that's interest rate parity then <coughs> d indicate by clicking in the relevant boxes whether the following statements on the characteristics of interest rate futures are true or false so in the kaplan text the characteristics of futures are clearly mentioned either currency futures or interest rate futures the characteristics are mentioned amounts and periods are standardized you don't get uh, futures either currency futures or interest rate futures on your own wish they are standardized they are legally binding yes every contract is legally binding apart from options i have told you this that options don't have an obligation everyone else has an obligation binding they can be bought and sold on secondary market secondary market means you can sell this to someone else yes future can be sold to someone else forward contract cannot be sold to someone else futures contract can be sold to someone else they can be used to both hedge as well as speculate yes uh, futures can be used to hedge as well and people who like betting and speculation they can use that as well so remember in this topic the currency risk management and the business valuation reading the text is very important because you see whatever theoretical questions i'm seeing they are coming straight from the kaplan text okay it's uh, four features are clearly written in the kaplan text that it's a standardized contract you cannot to use a tailor made contract in future that's standardized it's legally binding option is not legally binding others are legally binding you can buy and sell to others and they can use be used in hedging as well last requirement see this is a very mark scoring requirement as well if inflation is currently running at 3.8 percent per annum in central end what is the inflation rate in flyland if inflation is 3.8 percent per annum in central end what is the inflation rate in flyland now inflation rates are present in which formula i just told you purchasing power parity formula inflation rates are present in which formula purchasing power parity formula so if it states that inflation rate is 3% in central end what is the inflation rate in flyland so the inflation rate is present in purchasing power parity formula which is s1 is equals to s0 into 1 plus hc or ic country 1 inflation rate country 2 inflation rate okay now are you given spot rate yes s not is the spot rate right so are you given spot rate yes you are given spot rate 6.170 
S1 is forward rate. Are you given forward rate? Yes, three month forward rate is given 6.32. You are given spot rate as not 6.170. You are given forward rate as well, 6.321, three month forward rate. Inflation rate of two countries need to be placed. Now, since this spot rate 6.170, it's FF over CC. Remember, it's 6.170, 6.210 FF over CC. So since FF flyland is above, we will put the inflation rate of flyland above and CC is in denominator. So we will put inflation rate of CC in denominator. Okay. So inflation rate of flyland needs to be found out. Okay. Inflation rate of flyland needs to be found out. So inflation rate of flyland is X and inflation is 3.8% per annum in centerland. So what we are doing here is that we have the forward rate, okay, 6.321 and we have the spot rate. Since spot rate is FF over CC, it's a question that uh, which inflation rate will come in numerator, which in denominator, since FF is in numerator in the currency rate, the rate of FF will come in the numerator, that's to be found X and in denominator, the center length one. So the center length uh, inflation rate is 3.8% per annum. Okay, since the interest rate is 3.8% per annum, you have used the rate of three months, right? So you need to put a three month rate, that's 0.95%. Since it's 3.8% per annum, but you have put a three month rate. So rates have to be for three months. If you put per annum rate, you must put the forward rate of also for one year, but that's not available. Since you have put three month forward rate, that means you need to put a three month rate. And this will help you to find X. Okay, let me solve uh, it for X. X is coming as 3.4%. But this 3.4% is not per annum. It's three month rate, right? The question is asking annual inflation rate. So 3.4% is for three months. So for per annum, 3.4 is for three months. For per annum, you need to multiply it by four. It's 13.6%. And question is saying round off to the nearest person. So 14% will be the answer. Okay. This ends our all questions of uh, current series. If you have any questions, you can ask please and copy the solution. Yes, Arslan, you can do that. It's a payment question. That's why the rates we used are buying rates. Had it been a receipt question, Amir, we would have used the selling rates.
because abbas you are taking 6.321 as the 3 month forward rate so since you are taking 3 month forward rate you need to have interest and inflation rates for 3 months so assam 3.8% was per annum we need to put 3 months so 3 months is 0.95% 3.8% is for per annum so for one year you need to per month you need to divide it by 12 and for 3 months multiply by 3 Aman, it's just cross multiplication, mathematics. Apply the calculator on calculative values and do it. Yes, full marks will be lost. Basam, wrong. Receipt means you are receiving money. When you receive money from someone, we, you sell it to money changer. And when you are paying someone, you buy from money changer. Okay, now we will do one question of uh, business valuation uh, that's uh, in your handout called uh, Coral Company. So please uh, open this question of Coral Company. <laughs> Thank you. 
okay now as you all know that uh, in business valuation you may be asked to find uh, values of uh, the company and uh, you may be asked uh, to uh, find the market values of uh, debt so for that again this is not a part of long question only mtq and uh, those who are saying to repeat part a repeat part b actually i want to do one question of business valuation so you will have the recording of this webinar so please uh, you can uh, get back to it later apologies for that okay so let's start the question states the finance director of coral company has been asked to provide values for the company's equity and loans so finance director of a coral company has been asked to provide values for the company equity and loan notes obviously equity means shares and uh, value means uh, uh, loan notes means the company's debentures okay so the finance director has been asked to provide values for the company's uh, equity and loan notes coral is a listed company and the following long-term finance ordinary shares are 7.8 million 7% convertible no notes 8 million total capital structure comes to 15.8 million so finance director has been asked to provide values for companies equity and loan notes coral is a listed company has the following long-term finance ordinary shares are 7.8 million and 7% convertible loan notes 8 million ordinary shares have a nominal value of 0.25 per share this has been discussed multiple times in the classes that if ordinary shares in total are 7.8 million the capital and shares have a par value of 0.25 you can divide it to get number of ordinary shares which is 31.2 million okay ordinary shares have a par value of 0.25 and 7.8 million is the capital you can divide to get number of ordinary shares 31.2 million and are currently trading on an ex-dividend basis at 7.1 per share currently they are trading at 7.1 one per share so currently they are trading at 7.1 percent economic recovery has been forecast and so share prices are expected to grow by eight percent per year for the foreseeable future share price will go by eight percent per year loan notes are redeemable after six years at their nominal value of 100 and can be converted after six years into 10 shares of coral per loan so loan notes are redeemable after six years nominal value of 100 and converted on six years into 10 shares per 100 loan notes. Loan notes are traded on the capital market before tax cost of debt, KD, 5% and tax rate is 20%. Okay, this is the information that the finance director of Coral has been asked to provide values for the company's equity and loan notes. Coral is a listed company as following long-term finance, ordinary shares 7.8 million, convertible loan notes 8 million, 7.8 million 8 million ordinary shares of a power value of 0.25 i got number of shares 31.2 million and they're trading at 7.1 per share they will go at 8 percent per year and loan notes are redeemable after six years at 100 and they can be converted also into 10 shares and the cost of debt is five percent tax at 20 percent what is the equity market value of coral company what is the equity market value in millions equity market value is simply number of ordinary shares into current share price equity market value is simply number of ordinary shares into current share price so what are the number of ordinary shares 31.2 million and what is the current share price 7.1 7.1 is the current share price 31.2 is the number of ordinary shares so equity market value comes to The formula of equity market value value of shares is number of ordinary shares in the current share price you have the number of ordinary shares you have the current share price that's it okay now the second requirement is
assuming conversion, what is the market value of each loan note? Assuming conversion, what is the market value of each loan note? Assuming conversion, what is the market value of each loan? Now, if you look at the question carefully, it states here, the loan notes are redeemable after six years at par value of 100 or can be converted after six years into 10 shares of Coral Pearl loan note. Loan notes are redeemable after six years. Okay, they're redeemable at their par value of 100. And they can be converted after six years into 10 shares per loan. So loan notes are redeemable after six years at nominal value of 100. They can be converted after six years into 10 shares. Loan notes are traded on the capital market. Okay. Assuming conversion, what is the market value of loan note? This is a very mark scoring part. So please pay attention. What is the definition of market value of loan note please pay attention market value of loan note is defined as the present value of <coughs> outflows of loan note outflows of loan note are interest and redemption or conversion calculated on a before tax basis using cost of debt as discount factor if anyone doesn't know this thing I suggest them to please uh, learn this. This is uh, a very important uh, two marks area. It always comes in the exam. Always the question will ask when MCQ will ask you to calculate the market value of loan note. It's the present value of two outflows of a loan note. A loan note only has two outflows, interest and redemption or conversion, calculated on a before tax basis using KD, cost of debt as discount factor. So since this question is asking you market value of loan note, what is the market value of loan note? So market value of loan note is basically the present value of two outflows. Interest and redemption conversion discounted at K. Now this loan note is because you are solving this assuming conversion. You are solving this assuming conversion. Okay. So it can be converted after six years and it pays 7% interest. It's converting after six years. It's converting after six years and it pays 7% interest. So, one, two, five, six. Two headings are made because it is being converted after six years. So, two headings one, two, five, and six. Okay. Two outflows of this loan note interest and redemption or conversion but we are solving this assuming it's conversion do you think since it's a seven percent loan note so interest will be seven percent seven percent of what always par the par value of loan note is 100 so for six years the interest will be seven interest is paid each year right so seven percent interest of par value 100 so interest is 7% of par, 7% of 100, 7. Conversion. Look at the conversion. Converted after 6 years into 10 shares per loan note. So if you are converting after 6 years into 10 shares, each share is of 
7.1 no 7.1 is the today's current share price <laughs> It's growing at 8% per year. So if today's share price is 7.1 and it's growing at 8% per year, <laughs> since these 10 shares will be converted after six years, share price after six years will be 8% increase per year. So after six years, it would increase by 8% each year. Eleven point two six after six years because uh, seven point one is now. This is being converted into ten shares after six years. So since seven point one is the current share price, it's growing by eight percent per year. So after six years, it's going to be eight percent, eight percent, eight percent increasing. Eleven point two six. So this will produce. One one two point six six. So two outflows will be interest. You can write negative, positive, your choice. Seven. And if converted, another outflow company has to give ten shares at eleven point two six per share, not the seven point one. Two outflows. Net them all. You will get net cash flows. Seven. 119.66 these are the two outflows interest and redemption now to convert it into present value present value of outflows net cash flows need to be multiplied by discount factor which should be kd what is the cost of debt in the question cost of debt is five percent so i will look at the table Five percent, one, two, five, and six. So a five percent year six. It's zero point seven four six. Five percent year six. It's zero point seven four six. And five percent for five years. And UT. So you can see 5% for five years in UT, 4.329. Net cash flows into discount factor gives you present values. Seven into 4.329. And uh, 119.66 into 0.746. And if you add them all, you get total present value which is 30.3 plus 89.2 119.5 this is the present value of all outflows 119.5 so this is the market value of bond because you see i have fulfilled the definition this present value this is the present value of two outflows what i have done I have calculated the present value of two outflows, interest and conversion. That's what the definition is, present value of two outflows. Please copy this. <laughs> OS, you need to calculate for one bond. One bond is 7% of power. What you are doing is total. Ozafa, look at the definition. It's uh, calculated on a before tax basis. Settle so life, it's uh, 7.1 today and it's increasing at 8% per year. So after six years when it will be converted, share price will increase from 7.1 by 8% per year six times.
it's seven percent of par value hundred uh, uh, karanjit so seven percent of par value hundred is uh, seven Amir, this uh, is not a point of confusion whether the question is from VAC topic or valuation topic. Obviously, market value of loan note you have to calculate. So even in VAC, the market value of loan note definition is the same. Even in the business valuation, the definition is the same. So it doesn't matter. Okay. So we have got the equity market value, number of shares into current share price. We have also got uh, the uh, market value of uh, loan note. Which of the following statements about the equity market value of Coral Company are true? Which of the following statements are true? The equity market value will change frequently due to capital market forces. So Amir, that's a problem in your concept because that is done when you have to find KD, cost of debt. In market value of one, we never do this. In cost of debt, we do that thing which you are saying and in market value, we only do this. So this is a conceptual error from your end. So which of the following statements about equity market value of Coral are true? The equity market value will change frequently due to market forces. If the capital market is semi-strong from efficient, the equity market value will not be affected by the release of public of insider information. Over time, equity market value will follow a random book. Which of the following statements are true? Now, the conceptual statement among all these three is just two. That is the from the concepts. The others are general. You can answer them. Okay. So, the equity market value will change frequently due to market forces. What was the formula of equity market value? The formula of equity market value was number of ordinary shares into current share price. Remember, number of ordinary shares were 31.2 million and you multiplied with current share price that was 7.1, you get 221.52 million. It's saying that equity market value will change due to capital market forces. Now, do you agree that due to capital market forces, the share price changes? Yes, due to capital market forces, market conditions, the share price changes. So obviously, when share price will change, the equity market value will also change. When capital market forces will play their role, market pressures, environment, market conditions, the share price will also change and that will change equity market value. So this statement seems true that equity market value changes due to market forces because market forces change share price. If the capital market is semi-strong form efficient, the equity market value will not be affected by release of insider. 
this statement is a conceptual statement and this is wrong. Why? You were taught from Kaplan study text and uh, those who haven't studied this thing, they should listen. If market is weak form efficient, if market is weak form efficient, it can get affected by public news or information as well as insider information. If market is semi strong form, it gets affected by insider information. And if market is strong form, it doesn't get affected by anything. Okay, this is what was taught to you in three levels of efficiency that if markets are weak form efficient, they get affected by two things, public information and inside information. If markets are semi strong form efficient, they get affected by inside information. And if they're strong form, they don't get affected by anything. So look at statement two now. If the capital market is semi strong form, equity market value will not be affected by inside information. That's wrong. If markets are semi strong form, equity market value will be affected by inside information because uh, semi strong form means you will get affected by inside. They're saying it will not be affected by insider. That's wrong. And third, over time, equity market value will follow random walk. Now, what does random walk means? Random walk means no logic. Random walk means just a random on its own. No logic. So equity market values do follow a random walk because when you just look at the equity market value, equity market value is number of ordinary shares into current share price. Equity market value is number of ordinary shares into current share price. Current share price randomly change in the market. Sometimes they get changed due to results, due to use, due to manipulation. But sometimes they just follow a random walk. They randomly change without any reason, without any reason falling, without any reason rising. So this statement is also true. So the correct statements are one and three. The statement one was correct that uh, market value changes due to market forces because the share price changes. They follow a random walk as well. And equity market value is affected by inside information in semi strong form. It's saying it does not affect it, so it's wrong. Any questions, please ask. Maham, point three is random walk. Random walk means without any reason. So if you see the stock market, sometimes prices go up and down without any reason. Falling, increasing, it's obviously change in share price. Randomly changes share price, changes equity market value. D, indicate by clicking the relevant boxes whether the following are assumptions that are made by DBM. Now you have seen
Maham, random walk means without any logic. Okay, so if you look at the stock market prices, sometimes they go up and down without any reason. That is called random walk. So when it goes up and down without any reason, the share price changes and the equity market value changes. So equity market value does change due to random walk. Uh, Noman, ACCA does not publish uh, the section B questions of all attempts. For one or two attempts, you may get it from the website. Now indicate by clicking in the relevant boxes whether the following are assumptions that are made by dividend growth model. Dividend growth model formula is this. P0 is equals to D1 upon K minus G and in weighted average cost of capital the formula of K is D1 over P0 plus G. It's just rearranging, right? If you need to find P0 share price, it's D1 upon K minus G. And if you need to find K, it's D1 over P0 plus G. So identify by clicking in the relevant boxes whether the following are assumptions that are made by DVM. <laughs> Again, if you read the text of business solution, DVM assumptions are clearly mentioned. Dividends show constant growth or zero growth. Yes, the growth rate remains constant or there is no growth. Growth rate can never be negative. This is written in DVM disadvantages and assumptions that dividends show constant or zero growth. Investors make rational decisions. This is also written that they make rational decisions. Don't make irrational decisions. And dividend growth rate is less than cost of equity. That's not written, but that's uh, something you can get from, from, from the formula. Growth rate is less than K. See, the growth rate G has to be less than K. Otherwise, the answer of denominator will come negative. The growth rate G has to be less than K. K is 10%. It has to be less than that, 5%. Because if that is the case, then only answer will come positive, else the answer will become negative. So growth rate has to be less than cost of equity. This is also an assumption. All three are answers. Investors make rational decisions. That's written. Either show a constant growth or zero growth. Growth rate less than K. Last MCQ, why might valuations be needed for equity and loan notes? Why might valuations of equity and loan notes be necessary? In short, it is asking why you must value your shares and your loan notes. Why must you value your shares or loan notes? The company is planning to go for to the market for additional finance. Yes, if you want to raise additional finance. People ask you, what is your value? So due to this, it uh, might be necessary to uh, find the value because if you want additional finance. Securities need to be valued for tax purposes. A big wrong. Do you think to calculate taxation, you need to have value of your company? No. For taxation, you only need profits. For taxation, you only need profits. You don't need to have company's value. Like you go to taxation department, how, how much is our tax? They say, okay, what is your value? Taxation is never on value. It's on profits. So you don't need to value your equity and loan notes for taxation purpose. This is a big wrong. Two is wrong. The company has received a takeover bid from a rival company. Obviously, if someone asks you to acquire or wants to acquire you, for that purpose, you need to have a value. So one and three seem correct. Any questions with respect to last two MCQs, please ask. Uh, 
Rajiv, I'm sending you my number. Please drop a WhatsApp on this number after the class. And uh, I will add you in WhatsApp group. Recordings are shared there. Okay, now, uh, since this question is over, now we have uh, last five minutes. I have uh, uh, a good news and uh, a bad news for you uh, in this uh, last uh, three, four minutes. Okay. The bad news is that uh, this was uh, the last day of the webinar. It was uh, a four day webinar. So on day one, we uh noman i just saw your question and uh, you are saying statement one is right that's what i've written that statement one is correct so the bad news is that uh, this was uh, the last day of the webinar on the first day we covered uh, business uh, investment appraisal and on the second day we covered uh, <coughs> weighted average cost of capital then we covered uh, sources of finance then in today's session we covered uh, risk management and uh, finally uh, we had plans to do two questions of business valuation but we were only able to solve one question okay so obviously uh, as far as uh, the aspect is concerned uh, we are covering five sections Zan is asking why working capital management is not covered. Okay. Obviously, if anyone, I said this in day one as well, anyone coming uh, with the expectation that uh, you have uh, four sessions of three, three hours, total 12 hours, in every session there is 20, 20 minutes of break, you remove them. So you have 10 and a half hours and you expect that in 10 and a half hours, you will be able to cover each and every area of the syllabus. Impossible. Expectation is wrong. Okay. This is a wrong expectation that in 10.5 hours, you can cover an area which I teach personally when I teach to my regular students in 120 hours. Okay, so I think uh, this is an unrealistic expectation. Okay, in order to cover all areas, what we should do is we should not answer any of your questions because this also wastes time. Okay, we should just uh, quickly solve questions as if I'm just uh, reading and solving questions. No need to explain anything, no need to do anything, and just uh, quickly uh, solve the answers and go. Obviously, this is not uh, my style of teaching. Okay. So, whenever I conduct these webinars, uh, whenever I conduct these webinars, obviously it happens every time. Either I convert, conduct it for, sometimes I conduct it for advanced financial management, sometimes I conduct it for audit and assurance, sometimes I convert it, conduct it for PM performance management, this time I'm converting for financial management. Every time, the whole area is not covered. But this isn't a technological era. This is a technological world. You have uh, contact with me directly. If you have any questions uh, with respect to these webinars and you have <coughs> any problem in further areas, like for example, one student may message here that uh, why didn't we solve this question from the kit? Obviously, we cannot solve. This uh, is not possible that every student's requirement can be catered, but we have our contacts and I have my regular course as well. So if you have any problems in any area, you can always drop me a message. I can provide you video support. I can provide you tutoring support for one or two topic, obviously without any charge. So this will help you to cover it. Obviously we cannot, because we cannot cover everything in uh, these uh, 10, 11 hours. Okay. Secondly, I requested the ACCA to give me one more session like this. Okay. And uh, they said that uh, all the slots are occupied because obviously this is not the only webinar. The other papers webinars are also being conducted. 
So I requested them and they honored my request. So they gave me one additional day on 29th May. They gave me one additional day on 29th May. Okay. We will cover some more questions on that 29th May. The timings and stuff has been added in your schedule. Okay. So webinar was originally for four days, but uh, this uh, one day they gave me to my request so that I can uh, support you more. Okay. And still off if on that day as well, after that day as well, you still find uh, some confusing areas. You can always uh, drop me uh, a message. Again, some students are messaging WhatsApp link can't be copied. Copy isn't an option in the chat. Daily, I have told this thing four or five times daily. And uh, even my condition is not good and still you are forcing me again again to repeat the stuff. Even in today's class, this has been told three times that I have shared my personal WhatsApp number with everyone. And I've told them that please drop me a message. I will add you manually. Okay, I hope this helps because uh, even the whole four days are passed and still repeating the 10, 20 times a thing and still some students are just stuck on that WhatsApp group thing. Okay. So anyways, uh, we are just uh, ending the class now. Okay. And uh, I think I have shared two recordings of uh, first day and second day. Okay. And uh, the third recording is also ready. So I will just be sharing it after the class. And uh, those three days, the fourth day recording, today's recording will be shared uh, tomorrow. We will now meet on 29th, okay, and uh, I will cover some more areas in this particular 29th May recording. Thank you very much for attending. Before leaving the class, please do give a general comprehensive feedback of this four days, whether it's helpful or not, because this always helps us to improve further for the next webinars. Okay, take care. Thank you, and please don't go without uh, sharing the feedback.